I, I didn't have it on. Now go ahead. Hi, Bill. Uh, Francis O'Brien, glad to meet you. My name is Felix Jufre. Any relative of Colonel O'Brien, a regimental commander of the 105th Regiment, is welcome in my home anytime. Okay, let me just see, catch that up. Right, there. that's plenty. Uh, January 1941, I was inducted into the Federal Service at Camp Upton, at Camp Upton, Long Island, New York. From there, I was shipped to Fort McClellan, Alabama. In Fort McClellan, Alabama, I was in Company A of the 150th regiment with Captain O'Brien at that time as our company commander. And from there we went on the Tennessee maneuver and then we went to the Arkansas Louisiana maneuvers. Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like uh, at, Fort at Fort McClellan? Now, at Fort McClellan there was a beautiful fort. We were living in pyramidal tents. There was four or five, I think it was four or five of, of soldiers in each pyramidal tent. You said a pyramidal, you, you spelled that, a pyramidal? You got me there, pyramidal. Okay. okay. Well, I'll, just I'll, put down pyramidal, we'll look, look it up, up in the dictionary. Yeah. They were these campus tents, you know, they're pyramidal tents, we used to call them. And, uh, we had a PX of our own, and we had our own barracks where we had all our meals served to us. It was very interesting, and the whole division was stationed there at the time when the division was a square division yeah. with the 108th Regiment who, when the war broke out, they transferred and they went, they formed a new division with it, and they went to Europe, but we stayed on and we became what they call a triangular division, mm -hmm. which consists of the 105th Regiment, the 165th Regiment, and the 106th Regiment. And of course we had other attachments, anti-tanks and machine gun, and also we had the 102nd Air Force was with us there. 102nd Air Force? Yeah, the 102nd thing it was. Yeah, was that the field artillery or the? No, Air Force. We had there was a there was a couple of planes there were attached oh, to that okay. fort. Of course, all the field artilleries was the 105th, the 106th, and the 106th yeah. Regiment. All had our own artilleries. But anyway, it was December 7th, in 1941, when. We were in the barracks on a Sunday, that was. We were just lounging around, and we had our radios on, and we heard that Fort, or rather that, that um, Hawaiian Islands or Pearl Harbor had been invaded by Japanese, and we didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. But soon after that, we... I think it took us about a week. We packed up and we moved over to Gadsden, Alabama, and we were guard over the armory there. But McClellan was very, very interesting, very comfortable. We had everything we wanted in it. We had recreation halls and non NCO clubs, and there was officers' clubs, and we even had a big area there where we used to have the outdoor movies, we had sport arenas and whatnot. So that's, yeah. Not, that's uh, McClellan. When, when the war broke out, uh, that is to say Pearl Harbor, uh, 
different elements, I guess, of the division went to different parts of the South to to guard various uh, yeah, installations. Well, and your 105th went to Gadsden. Is that we went to Gadsden. Yeah, Gadsden, Alabama. Gadsden, Alabama. Right. And we took charge of the an armory there. They were making artillery shells. Uh -huh. I believe, if I remember correctly, there were 105 millimeter. artillery millimeter, 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 105 artillery pieces. Mm -hmm. And then from there we left after about, I think it was about 15, 20 days, we boarded a train and we headed for California. Did you no. said that was an open cattle car type train? No, they were a regular box. Box regular, car? Regular, regular uh, passenger cars. Passenger cars, cars okay. Yeah. They had in there the regular seats that opened up at night to beds, you know. Okay. Because we had no, we weren't stopping at any yeah. exclusive hotel or anything. And we went all the way to Fort Ord, did, did California. Uh, excuse me, did you, wasn't there a time when they went? Initially to um, near Los Angeles, Fort Hahn. We went to Camp Hahn. Camp Hahn. Camp Hahn at play. that time. And then from there we went to yeah. Fort Ord. Okay. Fort Ord, we put up our own pyramidal tents again, is that word? Pyramidal tent. Mm -hmm. And we took some advanced training there, which didn't amount to anything. Of great importance, but we had dry runs boarding the ships that were going to take us out into the Pacific Ocean. And one night, I don't know exactly the date, we boarded the Aquitania. You said, you said that was a German? The Aquitania was a German ship which we had taken away from Germany after World War I. Mm -hmm. It was a tremendous, oh, beautiful ship. But we were cramped in there. We had Australian troops in there and British troops. How we knew was the Australians were wearing these garrison caps, you know, that they pinned to the, on each side. Were they, were they at uh, Fort Ord as well? No, they can, we we they were already on board. Where they oh, came oh, from, oh, we oh, don't know. Oh, okay, already on but board. in Fort Fort Ord, there was just a division. Maybe they were Fort Ord too. I don't know. Okay. We didn't get around too much in Fort Ord. Okay. We, because we shipped out soon, soon after. Now the adventures, of course, and on the ship was very quiet and very nervous. You know, I mean, wondering where where we were heading for. And, of course, we also heard that we were heading for the Philippines, which didn't materialize. Mm -hmm. So we went to Pearl. You don't want to hear about the submarines there, do you? Yeah, tell me about yeah. the submarine. I was one, night, one night I had my guards out on, on board the Aquitania, and I was sergeant of the guards, so I went out on deck with permission from the Navy to see how my guards were doing. And I saw all these beacons sticking out of the ocean with red lights on the top. And uh, I asked one of the Navy men, I said, what in the heaven's name are those things? He says, we have 11 submarines charging up their batteries and they're right with our ship heading towards the combat field. and." in the Pacific. I said, oh my God, I said, tonight I can sleep at least. Because I thought we were traveling without any escort of any kind. Mm -hmm. We did have one other ship with us, the President, which headed down south, President. where they didn't tell us where exactly, but we suspected that it was Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal. Uh, now, at this time, you said you were Sergeant Guard. Were, what, you were you were a sergeant. Uh, what was your rank, and what 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 <coughs> what platoon were you in at the time? At that time, I held the rank of buck sergeant, three striper, three striper, and uh, I was sergeant of the uh, 
wait a minute, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong, I'll take that back. I was corporal then. Mm -hmm. We had corporals for squad leaders, and PFCs were scouts and second in command. And I was corporal of the second squad, or was it the first squad, let me see, I think it was first squad, of the second platoon. Second platoon. Who, who was commanding the second platoon at that time? The second platoon at that time was command commanded by Lieutenant Fig Fig Newton. Fig Newton. Was the call. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I want to ask you about him later, but uh, I didn't like him. I hope that didn't pick it up. <laughs> well, whatever. Um, he made his mistakes, which. But. Okay. From there, of course, from Hawaii, we took all our advanced training. Mm -hmm. I saw Pearl Harbor, what it looked like. The morning after we had arrived there, we couldn't get into Pearl. It was bottled up very bad. Our ships couldn't believe it, were sunk mm -hmm. and still steaming. There were ships turned over, and there were all our battleships were all well, it was unbelievable to see. It was a sight that actually you swear ten times that you'd kill a reach yeah. in the Pacific. So we headed for the Big Island of Hawaii. And the Big Island of Hawaii, we took our advanced combat training. Of course, the Hawaiian Islands consist, I think, of 11 islands, but actually most of them had been evacuated and there was three or four islands actually that there was population on them. And that was uh, Wahoo, Hawaii, Molokai, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Maui. Okay, so you did advanced combat training on, on the Big Island. On the Big Island. Then from the, from the Big Island of Hawaii we shipped out to Wahoo. So that's how you got, went to Schofield Barracks? Yeah, school. so we went to Schofield Barracks. Schofield Barracks was a beautiful setup. It was gloomy, dark, but there was plenty of air though. And we had double, double bunks there. Mm -hmm. uh, double bunks. There I received my sergeant stripes, tree stripes. And uh, we still had other training to do there. We were combat ready, at least. That's what we they told us that we were in. But actually, I was led to believe that the 20 some division was combat ready because we had two maneuvers under our belts. Mm -hmm. So was a few other divisions, very few of them. But from from Schofield, then we maneuvered around the Hawaiian Islands. We took wet runs by LSTs to neighboring islands like uh, uh, what was it, um, Maui. Okay, so we we invaded a couple of the islands in Hawaii as dry the, runs. These were practice runs for right. amphibious landings. Right, amphibious landings and all that. And by that time, of course, Captain O'Brien had left us. He was in regiment. He was already in regiment as a lieutenant colonel, and we had Lieutenant Butkus as our company commander, and Lieutenant Ackerman. Butkus, excuse me, Butkus had been the exec? He was exec to O'Brien. Oh, O'Brien, yeah. Okay, and then, and then uh, Lieutenant Ackerman became exact. Became, became uh, exact, and then Captain, Captain, or rather Lieutenant Ackerman. I don't know. He left. He went someplace else, and we had Lieutenant Drovers as the exec, oh, yeah. which he got killed on site. And right. I can tell you the story there. And uh, after further training, and uh, we finally were set up one night and we boarded a Navy amphibious 
ship of some kind, I couldn't tell you, but it was a, a Navy ship, and we were told one day that we were heading for the big island of Saipan, which was six miles by 18 miles. Okay, can I stop here for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back. Sure. But let me, uh, let me stop this. Let's, let's let's continue, uh, Mr. Dupa. Uh, while you were at uh, Fort McClellan, I left out one little clause which Colonel O'Brien took part in. I don't know if he wanted to say, but I'm telling him then we can. Yes, uh, can we turn now and go back for a moment to Fort McClellan? I'm particularly interested in what you remember about the so-called Ohio O H I O uh, incident. This incident happened during the maneuvers. Now, I don't remember if it was the Tennessee maneuvers or the Arkansas-Louisiana maneuvers, where the National Guards, I believe it was the second maneuver, Arkansas-Louisiana. The National Guardsmen were supposed to be discharged from the service in October of 1941, and their they were using the word Ohio, which meant over the hill in October. Mm -hmm. And by that they meant that if they weren't discharged by October, they were going to be over the hill in October. So they used to go around hollering and yelling, Ohio, over the hill in October. Mm. Now I remember one little incident where we had General Pinnell came through us one day with his big command car and his wife was in the command car too, believe it or not. And everyone started to yell, over the hill in October, Ohio, Ohio. So I thought from that incident alone that General Purnell and his wife, and we used to blame his wife was running the division at that time, believe mm -hmm. it or not, we were we went on a hike, I think it was about 60, 60 miles, which was, was one of the longest hikes we ever took, which was all afternoon and all night till morning. And it was a question what our feet was just laying, laying them forward, laying them down, and picking them up again. We were all numb. But that, is, that it was as far as the Ohio incident was. When we got back to Fort McClellan, of course, most of the National Guardsmen were discharged in October or maybe soon after that. Were some of them given furloughs? Yes, they were given furloughs and they were discharged. But a lot of them came back again when the war broke out. But some of them already had gone into OCS and became officers and that's when the war broke out and then yeah. and they were being sent to Europe and they were being sent all over and we got a lot of bad news about some of them that got killed in Europe and they got killed down in Guadalcanal and whatnot. Familiar names like uh, was Lieutenant Titterington. He was in Company A with his brother, the two Titterington. One of them went to Europe as a lieutenant and he, we got news he got killed. Okay, is that, that W.J. Titterington? Titterington, yeah. W.J., I know the two brothers. They're in the two brothers. Yeah. He got killed in Europe. <coughs> Where? You say... He got killed in Europe. Yeah. yeah. His other brother, Titterington, I don't know whatever became of him, but we had other sergeants from the National Guards who we heard became officers and went to Europe and got themselves killed like a Diogado, I believe it was. His brother wasn't our company yet, but his his older brother went to OCS and got killed in Okinawa. 
somewhere in Europe, I don't know. I thought that there was a Titterington that got killed on, uh, on Okinawa. Well, there were two Titterington. That's yeah. right. Now, I read about it, too, and there was this, his other brother that went to Okinawa, but he yeah. wasn't with us, though, with the 105th. Well, I didn't make Okinawa anyway, yeah. you know that. I got busted up. But he came with us and... Uh, there were two... Here, here's a photograph from uh, of Company A at uh, Fort McClellan, and there's a Staff Sergeant J.E. Tidrington, yeah, and then Staff, Staff Sergeant W.J. Tidrington. Well... Which, do you know which one went to Europe? I don't know that. We, of course, we had to respect the rank. Right. We never knew who. The first name from Shinola, all we remember was, this is Tetherington, that's Tetherington. And the both brothers were in Company A. Yeah. Now, one went to Europe as an officer. The other one, I don't remember where he went to. Okay. But like you just quoted, he got killed in Okinawa. I think he went to Company B as a boy. He was a lieutenant. But I'll, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but now, so now what else can I tell okay. you? Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, that while you're at McClellan, that Colonel or uh, Lieutenant Whalen got in a very serious uh, accident. automobile accident. Can you, do you remember what, the, what that was all about? Yeah, well, we had a fellow by the name of I'm not sure, but I think it was Private Canary, his name was, like the Bird Canary. He went to Los Angeles or San Francisco or what, and he was drunk or something or another, got into trouble, and was put into the guardhouse by the NPs. But this was this was at Fort McClellan? Fort McClellan, no. No, this was while we were at Fort Ord. And Lieutenant Whalen, at that time, Lieutenant Whalen was the first lieutenant. He, he and a sarg couple of sergeants. I remember the sergeant, but I can't think of their name right now. Would it be Raka, Coca, yeah, C O C C A. Right. And another sergeant. Here's a photograph here of, uh, of, of Kennery. And then there's a sergeant. He was a hell of a nice guy, this sergeant. Uh, uh, this is. Nope, I can't. Okay, the sergeants, the non commissioned officers are up here. So. Right, that's what I'm looking at. This is not. out again and they got into a terrible accident now everybody else came out all right but lieutenant whalen had a leg of his own magnal definitely understand in fact he was being threatened to, be, to have his leg amputated but that was the end of lieutenant whalen from there when we never he was transferred to some other service which yeah. I understand he never came overseas anymore. He wasn't able to. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, after after the twenty uh, seventh move to Hawaii, uh, yeah. uh, I've been told that during that period there were a lot of a lot of men who were transferred out of the 27th or in cadre to other yeah, outfits. Can you describe generally that, what, what happened there? Well, there was a call for any of the men from our division who want to go to OCS or who want to... But this also occurred while we were at Fort McClellan, you know. Some of okay. them transferred there, but a lot of them was from Hawaii. And they transferred over to different services, like some of them, like I remember there was a Sergeant Love, he transferred to the parachuters, and there was another guy, another one, Ed Joe, 
Yes? All right. And there was a few other privates that I knew very well that transferred to the parachute. Vince, Vince Busson went to the Air Force, the Army Air Force. Well, I tell you, things were moving so fast yeah. that I couldn't keep up with them. You know what I mean? We had our own problems, you know, training and all that and preparing. But a lot of them, they transferred to the European services and they went to other services in the States mm -hmm. from the Air Force. There was another a private which I helped out when I took his BAR rifle off his shoulders. He joined the Air Force. We got a letter from him that he became a major. Yeah. Well, he he had college education and all that. Yeah. And uh, he was well to do anyway. I can't forget. I can't remember his name, but I know he was. He and his family were responsible in New York City for the bathing suits. Um, Zenith, you know, the, the shows that little girl diving into a pool or something. Oh yeah. Something like that. But anyway. He was well to do because I remember during the maneuvers in Texarkana, we went to a hotel and he invited a bunch of us non coms to go up there and take a shower and whatnot. He had money, you know. I mean, as a private, mm -hmm. it was only $21 a month or 30, $36 or $30 rather. But he, he had money coming in from his family. I can't. Sometimes the names they come in so fast. I sure. Yeah. Well, we can we can stop here, uh, yeah. and when we get back, I want to just uh, touch a little bit about uh, on on Macon and what you heard about it from the third battalion guys. But that we that we come back, and then we can go into Saipan. Okay. okay because just I could give you no. I want to give you another answer. Okay. Sure. I don't. The the training that we went into. I hope it's not on there. Don't put it on. This the one about Butkus when he. I recall now the story is really what the way I should have wrote it out to you was that they claimed they went in, that this is on now, they went in like parade soldiers. They were wearing khakis. The officers were wearing khakis with their bars. The non-commissioned officers were wearing khakis with their stripes. The privates were wearing and blue, blue, der blue denims or or they're what do you call herringbone twelves, hmm. and they all were dressed to kill. Is this both the 165th and the 105th? Yes, the 105th, 3rd Battalion, and the 165th. They went in. I think that Lieutenant Drovers went in, though. That's where I must have got it mixed up that I was with him. I don't know why. But Lieutenant Drovers and I used to get along fabulously. Mm -hmm. He used to tell me a lot of stories. And he, he told me other adventures that happened there. but. That was it, and then and we called. He called the Coutique, I remember, at Schofield Barracks. They, I couldn't think of it before. Schofield yeah. Barracks, the big or the big auditorium they have there. We called them. We we sent out um, memos, you know, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Rovers, and we got up on the stage and and we spoke to all the brass and Don Con that any campaign in the future we'd go in and looking like a bunch of bums. All wear the same uniform. Yeah. Nobody wear any stripes that will show what you are, or who you are, and we all have combat names. Yeah. And believe it or not, it worked from there in because the hundred and sixth went into and we talk in Kwajalein, Although they had their casualties, eh? but you couldn't tell a, a private from a general. Yeah. Because the Japanese snipers would go after anybody who they the ran. They knock out the leaders, and yeah. uh, the enlisted man couldn't maneuver by himself. He needed a leader. And on Saipan, we came out with a better idea. They came out. They put a number on your back of your rank. The number nobody knew. I had a thing was an eight for the staff sergeant, and it came all the way down or went all the way up to whatever the general was. And uh, we went in, and of course we all looked alike. We went in with our helmets, with a webbing over the helmet, and we put branches in it. And we went in with beards. Hmm. Nobody even shaved at all. I says, I remember Lieutenant Drummer says, nobody should be clean shaved. So of course they blamed it all. They said, this way the mosquitoes won't bite us. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the end of that. Of course, 
That worked out. Did he ever say anything about what happened to General uh, Colonel Conroy? The way I heard the story was that Colonel Conroy, his Higgins boat came up on shore, the ramp went down, and the way I understand that he told me was that Colonel Conroy just about just stepped over onto the ramp and caught a bullet between his eyes. Mm. And he fell right back into the Higgins boat. That's the way I heard it, and that's the way I related the story to it. Others, I says, my God, a regimental commander getting killed that way? I says, oh, it can't be. I <clears throat> couldn't believe it. But I remember uh, we... There are, there, are, there are other descriptions of that, but, uh, you know, I'm sure there were lots of different stories out there. Uh, yeah, well, we had heard other stories about the Japs, and uh, there was one story, I think, that Lieutenant Drovers brought out the... First time he came across Japanese soldiers there, or uh, Japanese officers with samurai swords. Uh -huh. and this, the was that, this was that naked. Yeah, and the sergeants were wearing the short sword. Hmm. And of course, the on Saipan I saw it. I saw it there, of course, where the Jap officers were wearing the three swords that I have picture right there. Mm -hmm. The samurai, the short sword, and and the small where they disembowel themselves with. Mm. But uh, all those stories there were strictly, there are a lot of hardship stories, which there's no sense even talking about them because no campaign is an easy right. fight. You get, the, you get your um, hardship cases that they come from every town, Dick and Harry has a different story. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, why don't we go over to uh, Saipan, when did you first uh, learn that? Uh, now, on Saipan, we made, we got called one time to the rear. And Colonel O'Brien was there, and Colonel, Mc, Colonel uh, what, De Delescu, he was a ranger officer there, and he was, he was a lieutenant colonel. Delis. And uh, there was also lieutenant colonel, I forget his name, I know him very well. He was assistant to Colonel O'Brien. He, geez, I can't think of his name because I remember of an incident that happened on Air Slido Airport with that officer. But anyway, not, uh, not, uh, 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 it was Lieutenant Colonel, it was. Okay, go ahead. I'll. I'll We'll, we'll get his names. The names, of course. You know, sometimes these names all come back, and then sometimes I can't even remember my own name. But that's what you get when you get to that age of 40 on one leg. Yeah. So anyway, we were brought down. We were on board the ship, and we were called down to the to a lower deck on the ship, and they uncovered a big table, and they had the whole map of a side pen there what they believe was, that was on Saipan. And uh, they told us that the 27th Division was going in with the 2nd and 4th Marine Division, which I said, that's great, three divisions. I said, wow, that's about 60,000 men, yeah, I figured. Yeah. They told us there was a garrison of about 35 or 40,000 Japs on the island as well. They told us, too, that there was the civilians were dead against us. They were told that we were all Yankee devils. And we made our invasion, I think it was one or two days after the Marines went in. They were having a hard time. Marines were? The Marines, yeah. So finally they called us in. We were, so we went into the center, the second Marine, the fourth Marine on the left, and the second on the right, and we went into the center. Mm -hmm. And I remember there we went in, but there was no, not too much activity. There was some artillery fire and sniper firing, but we were all dug in and hanging around. And they told us that we were trying to get rid of our sea legs. And I remember sitting on sit on one of those planes, flat on my back, on my, with my head, and I had my rifle between my toes, 
which I always kept it there at the ready, I saw two sea police sergeants bring in a geisha. That's the first time I saw a geisha. Little girl, cute looking bitch. And uh, they were they were lifting her, they were big marines and they were holding this girl practically up in the air, one on the under each armpit. That's all they had to do, they lifted her right up yeah. and they brought her in. And we were I don't remember exactly where we landed there, but there was a there was a, they told us that there was an, an ammunition factory there, because there were guns there that were all smashed to pieces which the Navy had busted up the place, you know. Mm -hmm. They gave them, they gave them 72 hours of indoctrination. Naval bombardment, yeah. Right. Well, anyway, I'll go into another little story, which I did, I don't know if I send it in to uh, the Orient before or not, but while we were still on board the ship, mm -hmm. I came, we came to Saipan, the ship was on the outskirts of Saipan, and this was at night, I'm leaning on the railing, and I'm looking over the railing at Saipan, and you can see explosion, because the Navy was still sending some of their shells mm -hmm. over. And the Marines had already, were go going in the following day, and they had gone in after the following day. But that night, I'm leaning over the railing, and I had about two or three new recruits in my squad, which they trusted me with them. One of them was a fellow by the name of Washburn. Washburn? Yeah, and the other fellow was Lund. The third one, I don't remember. Well, I think I only had two. But anyway, these two recruits come over to me, over to the railing, and they, they told me, Hey, Sergeant, the way they're bombing that island, he said, Chances are there'll be no Japs waiting for us. <laughs> so I turned around, I told him, I said, no, don't kid yourself. That island is, they're waiting for us to come in. He's there loaded. He said, so I had told him, I said, the Marines all just went in during the day. I said, we'll probably be called in next, yeah. uh, tomorrow. By which. So I'll tell you then what happened. The place was uh, really on fire. It was really being bombed. It was on unbelievable but I was saying how in heaven's name can anybody survive mm -hmm. father Burnett came over to me that night do you know him you're familiar with him yes, yes. he was a regimental uh, right. commander there in chapel chaplain he came over to me he says he knew me by name he says he's GI he says I said what's the matter his father he says boy look at that side hand the way they're heading it he told me he says I want you to go to confession I said, no. I said, you can't get, get me to go to confession. I said, because I don't know if I'm coming out of this thing alive. So I remember telling him, you give me a pair of pontoons, I told him. I said, I'll put them on and I'll start walking back to California <laughs> instead of going into Saipan. I said, I'm not going to no Saipan, into any confession because I'm going to go in there and I'm going to kill, kill like crazy. So he let go. And these two guys, new fellows here, they, they walked away too. And I was still looking and then I turned away and I went back. The next morning we were called for an early mess. Steak from the Navy. I said, oh, boy, this is it. Yeah. Four o'clock in the morning. Now we were told that we were going to land on Magician Bay. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but we got on the Higgins boats. We come down the cargo nets, got on those Higgins boats, and we were starting to rendezvous going around in circles. And I'm looking over the top of the Higgins boat at Magician Bay. The submarines had taken pictures of the island by periscope. They were sure what Magician Bay was like. And from the pictures, it looked like beautiful sandy beaches to go in and kind of be up on top of the no they were all just sheer cliffs with holes in there which we have figured they were caves with yeah. Japanese in there yeah. so what they did was they pulled us back in 
to the to the landing boats, you know, the landing ships. And we went up the cargo nets, and we went up and we laid around, and then we got a call again for another steak dinner around seven, eight o'clock in the morning. I said, I didn't mind that either, mm. <laughs> after eating sea rations and whatnot. And we got on these Higgin boats again, went down the cargo nets, and this time they told us, we're not going into Magician Bay. We are going in between the 2nd and 4th Marine Division. So, when we were heading towards the beaches, I said, oh, well, it's more civilized, it looks like. It did look like beaches. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that that was a very heavily defended position, Magician Bay. Uh, it was ugly. Yeah. Because I understand that, I mean, that this is off the record, I understand that I think it was the 3rd Battalion that went up there when we were on Saipan already, went up there to cut off that that area from the Japs, and uh, I don't know, they screwed up or something or another, and that 3rd Battalion was, well, they were criticized, and I don't know what happened really, but Colonel O'Brien, he told us, he said, 3rd Battalion is all screwed up out there. They, instead of cutting off the Japs in that area, the Japs were coming through their line, and they were hitting us in the back. Was that the second battalion or the third? The third. Third. The third battalion screwed up. Okay. But anyway, we were given orders when we were on Saipan after I had seen these geisha, this geisha girl. One one class, one go back, one more. What was it like coming in on the boats? Uh, I've been told stories that there were bodies floating in the water. Uh, the smell of death uh, was in the air. I tell you, I looked around and I was looking over, it was curious. I used to look over the side many times. We had a coxman behind us with the boat, and they, and we all had our rifles loaded. And I remember Lieutenant Newt was in the boat with us too, and he told us, he says, keep your head down. I told him, I used to tell him, I says, I want to see what's going on. But I didn't see no bodies floating around that area where I was. Mm -hmm. But when we hit the shore though, we hit the beach, there were a few bodies in the low part of the beach, you know, floating around yeah. in the water, which I noticed were, some were Japanese and some of them were Marines, and but they were being evacuated anyway, yeah. the bodies. But there was a sting there because some of those bodies were being covered with maggots. Yeah, well, that's what I've read, yeah, I've heard that. The, the smell, you know, I mean, of course, I can tell you another little story about a Japanese body I came across at one time. But anyway, we went in, and I'll never forget, I hate to say this, they had this girl up against a tree, or a palm tree, one in front and one in back, those two Marines, they were trying to rape her. Mm. She pulled the grenade out of her hair, it seemed that way, and she went like that, now, they had told us that the grenades had to be hit, which we never had come across them, but that, and she put it on her chest, and all I know is I, we got the order then to move away, and, and I heard something go, boom! I turned around, there was no Marines, no body, no nothing. Mm. Disappeared. She blasted herself. So I never asked any question what the devil happened to yeah. her. I didn't give a damn. I was saying, well, it seemed to me that's what they were trying to do. Yeah. So... So we moved out, yeah. and uh, we moved into an area where it was very, very interesting, I tell you the truth. There was a road, and we were told that there was going to be about three or four tanks coming in from that area. Now this is before I went scouting for the, where the tanks were hiding. They were going to come in from there, so what our guys did was, or the engineers, they got some of the Japanese shells they found there. They set the fuses and they put them in the roadway on the ground and buried them. And I remember these tree tanks come up. These are Japanese tanks. Japanese tanks came up. One of them hit this here shell that we had buried there and it blew itself up. Hmm. The other two, they turned around and they tailed out again. They ran for it. One of our boys, a buck sergeant, I think his name was Diogardo, I think, 
I'm not sure. He come out in the middle of the road with a samurai sword howling. Bonsai, bonsai. Well, what's the first thing you would do? Yeah. We were up there right away, pulled our rifles and wondering where they're coming from. So I heard somebody's voice up there. He said, get that sword away from me. He says, we're going to, and furthermore, he said, we get out of here, you're going to be broken. Yeah. That was the end of that. So who was so that? I was in this open area all by myself in a little open area about this room with boulders all around me. And I'm leaning up against the rocks this way with the boulders with my legs crossed and I got my rifle across my toes. I don't know where the hell it came from. Three Japs come popping up on me like that from down the hill. They come up on me. So from the position I was, I let go of my rifle. Dun, 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 seven shots. I unloaded a whole clip and put another one in. Two of them took off and one fell. And I laid there. I didn't give a damn. I said, what the hell? I don't mean nothing. A couple of guys from my uh, my squad that were down near the hole somewhere, they come running up. They're they hollering, hey, Jupe, are you all right? I said, I'm all right. Lieutenant Fig Newton comes over to me. He goes over. These two kids there, remember these kids, they come over first. They saw this dead chap, and they took his wristwatch, hmm. and they showed it to me. He said, hey, Jupe, look at this. Now, they have a cover on the wristwatch. He opened it up, he said, yeah. He says, look at that, the guy is married and got a couple of, couple of kids. So I said, so what do you want from me? So they left, then Fig Newton come up. He come over, and he come over to me, and I was still laying back there, I didn't give a damn. He said, what the hell did you hit him with? I said, in the position I was in, I had like a volley of seven shots, a whole clip, you know. Bing, 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 bing. Oh, no, and I took one fast glimpse. All this part of the head was missing. I hope seven bullets all went into one area. Part of the head was missing. Mm. So I pointed, Todd walked away and I just leaned up against the rocks again. I told the tent, you know, I told Fig, I said, I said, what, the, what happened? I said, what do you want me to do? He said, one bullet would have been enough. So I said, when we get back to Scofield Barge, I told him, charge me for the other six. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember sort of what when that was? Was it like in the day after he landed or it must have been no more than a couple of two two days after yeah. we landed because the, the area around that area around that time it wasn't too much activity going on oh they were dropping a few shells here and there oh there was one incident which I gave it to the Orient um, I may as well tell you this one here this was a beauty when I was on deck the ship that night that I told you I was watching the TV the Saipan being bombed and all mm -hmm. that There was a kid from the kitchen, Buck Sergeant, he was a cook. He came over to me, he said, hey, Juve, he says, I want to come in with you. I, I looked at him, I said, you're in the kitchen, you're a cook. He said, I want to come in with you. I said, he says, put me in the squad. So I said, okay, I'll put you second in command of one of the squads in the platoon. He liked the idea. In the morning, when we made our first attempt to land, and we came back, he came over to me, he said, hey, Jeff, he said, I don't think I want to come in with you. Mm -hmm. I said, well, look, now, I gave you a squad. I said, I can't just turn around and switch these fellas here. You know, they got to depend on somebody. So I told him, his name was Jackie Breen. I don't oh, know if he yes. is. That's I him. know that guy. Jackie Breen. Maybe he's alive yet. I don't know. So I told him, I said, all right, Jack, I'll tell you what you do. When we land, if you get into any kind of trouble, yell for me and I'll come over and see what's going on. Well, so help me, I tell you. When we landed in there, we weren't moving up yet. There was some shelling here and shelling there and there was sniper activity. I'm telling my guys to dig in and wait for further orders. I get a, I get a call from Jackie Breen. Now with all that noise there, you'd imagine you'd say, you hear, you can, you're hearing things. I hear him calling, hey, Jeffrey. <laughs> so I turned around to my guys, I was digging, I said, Jackie's in trouble. I crawled over to his area. I came to an area, believe it or not. Frank, when I tell you, it was clean, beautiful. There was a lawn. 
there were palm trees. And I said, what the hell's going on here? Now I had told Jack, and I don't know if you want to record this, I said, if you're in trouble, call me, but tell me one thing. If there's a Jap there, the first dead Jap you come across, call me. I says, and we'll piss on the bus. <laughs> so he called me and he tells me, he said, we got one over here. I saw this Jap laying on the ground. There wasn't a bone in his body. Concussion or whatever it was. I don't know. They say concussion did some of the strangest things. Mm. They were, his face was flat. His whole body was just, looked like it had been deflated. So I told Jack, I said, what's wrong? I found a Jap over here. I said, all right. So we whip it out and we're taking a piss on him. Who catches us? Father Burnett. Mm. He turns around, he gives us a lecture. He says, G.I., he says, you realize that's a human being, he said. One of you guys should think of burying him. Mm. You know what I told him? I said, Father Burnett, I said, I don't know who's going to bury me. At that moment, I hear in the, out in the air coming in, a shell whistling, you, you, you. I said, oh my God, this one is coming in on a lap and was dying in midair. Till this very day, I still see that shell. Mm. It hit the ground into the sand, just spinning there, then go off. I got up from my position, because Father Burnett, and we all hit the ground. We all got up and I think I took about nine directions and fourth I was out of I was out of that area in a hurry. I wasn't gonna wait for that thing to go up. Because till today I think that shell was sticking out of the ground that far. Mm. Must have been one of their heavy mortar shells. If it went off or not, I never know. But we took we all took off. And I never saw Jack anymore. I didn't see Father Burnett anymore that that time, but I heard that he ran across a machine gun and got hit in the legs a couple of times, I don't know. But anyway, Father Burnett? Yeah, Father Burnett. Well, he died recently, you know. Yeah, okay. So from there in, I lost track. Let me well, have to interject, uh, Jackie Breen is... is uh, I lost track of him, whatever happened to him. Well, he, he, I don't know if he's still alive, but I, it's interesting. He was, uh, I mentioned uh, Jack Prout to you. He was my uncle by marriage. Jackie Breen was his Jackie? nephew. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's no. sort of a, that's just an aside. But <laughs> well, I know, but I, he was a cook. He was with the cooks there. Oh, yeah. And okay. that's like I was saying. I, said, I don't know why in the heavens then he wanted to come in with us. Yeah, yeah. He wanted to see what the hell's all going on. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I remember then we were moving in a couple of days later or whatever from that incident there. And Lieutenant Fig came over to me and said, we're going up to Moppy Point. Now, Moppy Point, did you know anything about that Moppy Point? Today they got a big obelisk up there. It's still there, in fact. I know it's way up in the northern part of yeah. the island. We have moved up in that area. We're moving up into the south or to the border. I don't know. We were said zigzag all over the place. We went up there, and I saw some of the strangest things. There was a big Japanese flag about as big as this room, flat on the ground. There was about seven or eight Japanese sitting there with white robes on. They were passing that short knife I got over there. Hmm. Pull it out, pass the next guy, down he go. The women with babies up there were done, jumping off the cliff. There was a there was an area there that was I didn't know what was down there until I saw myself. They were diving off. The kids were maybe the woman or a man would give them a grenade alive, act them and they were throwing them back and forth at each other like a ball, and then boom. I said, I don't believe this. Yeah. You know, we didn't fire a shot up there at all, and all these guys committed Harry Carey, and all these six, seven women, whoever they were, I don't know, I couldn't count them, and kids, they all died, they all dived off. So when I went over to the edge, what a sight. It was all coral stone down in there, and they were diving off. Mm -hmm. And this was before, I guess, the big bonsai attack, right? We're coming around to that, yeah. yeah. But I, mean, I just want to put it in time reference. It was right, that's what I'm doing. So, all right, we moved out of that area. And we got to the edge of this moppy point. And the lieutenant turned around and he said, well, we got to go down this hill. I don't know if you know about this, because I wrote to the, the yeah, story. Orion. Yeah, I got that story. Yeah, 
you probably know that one there. That's a true fact. What happened there was that went by two. he he t- turned around. We were on the edge of the, this hill to go down because we come up on one side where we saw. Yeah. Guy, but on the other, one, so he turned around. He's okay. He says, he says, Juve, go ahead down. So I looked at him. I said, after you. Yeah. So I turned around. I says, I'm not going down that guy's damn hill. Not I'm not going to face any of those guys going down a hill. Well. He took two steps, three steps over the top of that hill there, and he came, he flew back on his face. Two machine guns down below opened up on him. Along the ground, you can see the bullets bouncing up on us. So he turned around to me, he says, all right, Juve, tell me, what do you suggest? I says, well, let me send my liaison man back for for a couple of tanks. That was Lund. Lund, okay. He was my liaison man. So I told him, Lund, go back and bring a couple of tanks up. Bring them down the bottom and around the bottom of the hill and get those machine guns out of there. He comes back with the with the tank, sitting on top of the turret, because the tank was all buttoned up. Yeah. He's sitting on the top there with his telephone, giving those guys down the tank, the one tank he come around with, giving them orders, a firing order. I'm howling to him, Lund, get off that goddamn turret. Yeah. He's t- howling back at me. He said, he said, hey, Juve, they won't hit me up here. You know damn well they only hit you down on the ground. Because the chap had that habit. He hit you in the legs. Yeah. He figured, wound one, take two guys to evacuate you. So you lose three guys. Yeah. So, all right. So he, he came along. The tank was down there. Then he got off the tank and he come running up at us. And they opened up with their 105 short holluses on the tank. <coughs> the ground was being plowed, and you can see hands and arms flying all over the place. I said, oh my God, it was quiet. Now I told him, I said, I said okay, Frank, we can go down now. We walked down. A lot of shot was fired. We went down. I get to the bottom, Frank turns around and he says, where's your squad? Where's my squad? On the top of the hill, they were looking down at me. They were scared stiff. Mm. He turned around to me and he said, he's all right. He said, go ahead up there and bring him down. I said, you're ready of mine. I'm not going up there and expose my back to the enemy over here. I said, no. I said, well, get them, get those, get them guys down here. So I said, I'll go around the hill. I loosened up the sling of my rifle. Boy, I swear, if Fig Newton deserved a good bullet, I was going to stick a bullet right up his his nose, that's how mad he made me that, that day. So I loosened the, the sling of my rifle, turned it upside down, hung it on my shoulder with the butt up. I said, I was saying to myself, I hope somebody shoots me in a, in a can or in the legs and I'll get the hell out of here after some of these stupid errors. But anyway, I stopped walking. Two lead Japs come up on me, on the other side, coming down. I knew they were lead because they were wearing britches. Wow. They were wearing white shirts, and one of them had a white sash around his head with a black lightning on it, you know, embroidered in. Now, I had been told that they had seen these here from previous fights, you yeah. know, from the 3rd Battalion and all that. All right. They went by me. They were laughing. They had their hostess on. They had their handguns in their hostess, they never even had took it out of there. I looked at them, they looked at me, and believe it or not, I didn't even take my rifle off my shoulder. We passed each other's up like that. I don't know where they went to. And I went out there, and I went up that hill, and I got those guys, and I told them, yes, I don't want to say son of a bitch. I said, guys, damn it, I'd come all the way around. I almost got myself killed. I don't know why those Japs didn't want to kill me. Oh, I don't want to shoot them. I thought, come on down, we're going down there. We got to move up with Lieutenant, he's waiting for us. And that way we came down. I told Lieutenant Fig what happened. He says, he looked at me as though I was having illusions. I said, why, you don't believe me? He said, well, he said, these things do happen or something like that, he said. And we moved off. We moved off the area there and we got 
this must have been maybe another day or so, we come down to a field. It was a beautiful open field. Oh, it was all open. I said, my God. And we were all sitting on the side of the hill looking down. Just about in front of us, let's say maybe a couple of two, three hundred yards away, there was corn stalks bundled up. And I'm looking at them. I said, hey, do you guys see those corn, corn stalks over there? They're moving. They were hopping. Hmm. I, there must be chaps in them. Or what's in them? Nobody was doing anything about it. I said, take a couple of pop shot at them anyway. See if they fall over. Hmm. Nobody was doing nothing. But they were moving. Hmm. All of a sudden, way out in the far distance, we see a guy in uniform. So I take the field glass and I'm looking at him. And he's got field glasses on. I, that's one of our guys. What the hell are you doing way out there? No Marines are out there yet. No, we haven't advanced that far. And he's way up there. One of our news correspondent oh, guys. Yeah. So we wave him in, you know what I mean? He comes in. And he took word from us, you know, that what the hell we were doing this and, and all that stuff then. He was glad that he came in. And I didn't see him anymore that day. The next day, Lieutenant Fig calls me and says, Joe, I said, what? He says, you got to go back. We had taken that to the airport already. I yeah. didn't tell you about that, did I? No. I but anyway, this incident, then we'll go back how we took Esleto. He told me, you got to go back to Esleto Airport. He says, Lieutenant Colonel, his name, I can't get it. I said to Colonel O'Brien at the time. He's over there, and he told me, he said, the jab snipers are disturbing his breakfast. It's very crying out, kid, I said. All right. I take two men with me. I took, I took Lund with me and another guy, another kid. Is, and, is this Emmett Catlin, by chance? Hmm? Emmett Catlin? No. Now this was Lieutenant Colonel. Sam. He was a he was a nice guy, but not the best I've seen. I remember when we had him doing the maneuvers too in Tennessee, and he took me out with him. But that's another crazy story. There, he was looking for a place where I have a souvenir someplace over here. He's, there's an ore mine over here, and they picked up a hunk of steel. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like a nugget. But anyway. We go down to Ashley Airport, and I went there with Lund, the other guy. I'm scouting around, I'm looking for my two guys. Where are you guys? Oh, we're down there. They were down in the position, they're looking for souvenirs. That's the guys, damn Marines and, and Army. They're notorious for souvenirs. Mm -hmm. So we move into the airfield, and I saw sights there. There was Japanese bombers there, and there were zeros, all in, you know, they were all fenced off, and they, and they, there were signs on them, do not touch. They were all booby trapped, you know, ready to oh, blow. Yeah. So we came, I came across a big grass shack. And there's a door, and I put my foot in there. And I hear a couple of guys in America saying, Hey, he said, you know, yesterday I was way up in the front over there. No Marines and no Army was up there. And I was, and I came back, I said, he tell you, he was saying, I don't get paid enough to go that far around to the front. So he didn't know I was there. So I turned around and I said, well, I am these two guys over here. We don't get that much that much of a pay either. We're the guys that waved you in yesterday. Mm -hmm. Boy, they froze up. Yeah. Was, they were living there. There was two of them, or three of them, corresponding guys. Mm -hmm. So from there, I brought my report back. I said, well, the colonel now, colonel whoever it was, can have his breakfast without disturbance. We found nothing. Now, the day before, we got our orders to go up on Esleto Airport. The Marines had gone up there, I understand, two days in a row and two nights in a row they were bonsai off. Mm -hmm. We went up there, we formed our line on Esleto Airport airfield in broad daylight right up from where they all can see us and I was cursing like crazy saying they can see us where we put our 
rifle lines over here about foxholes. I, I, whose main idea this is? They'll kill us all. Somebody hollers over to me and says, hey, he says, hey, Jew, but you shut up. I don't know who it was. If it was Butkus, or who in the hell the name it was. As soon as the darkness came along, he says, okay, we're pulling out. I said, well, that sounds good. Build your foxholes on this side. So we left these here open. That morning we catch a bonsai, mm. small one, about 30, 40 chaps come up on us. So they're all firing in this area. We were on the other side getting cross fire, we, mm. we killed them all. So I said to myself, I said, whoa, I said, and I was bitching like crazy said, yesterday afternoon over here. That's where they that way. But anyway, we took Asleto. That's the day when, in, on Asleto Airport, I saw a zero mm -hmm. fight, fighting two Corsairs up in the air, dog fight. The most interesting thing that God ever created, but that zero, it seemed to me like he should stop in midair and get at the tail of the Corsair, boop, 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 boop. Corsair come down, pilot bails out. There was a cruiser down in the area there. He'd come out and pick him up. The way it was happening, I thought it maybe looked like a maneuver. Well. But that was a jab zero. Hmm. And I'm still looking, and all of a sudden, he's chasing the other Corsair. The Corsair was behind him, then he's out of the clear blue sky, like he turned in midair, because those zeros were made of tissue paper. Yeah. Turned around and gets him in the back. Put, 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 put. He come down, bails out. I said, I don't believe this. Two Corsairs. They were Marines, you know. He gets picked up. Now this zero comes into Astley, you know, we shrink from the hell out of us. And he's coming on one side. Now they had bunkers on that airfield there where they used to put their planes. It was just hills. The planes were and I was going up the bunker, get up to the top, I'd see him coming in that way and I'd fall over the other side. I'd come around, jump again, and he was shrinking the hell out of us. I didn't see anybody getting hit, but Suddenly I saw, it was a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on a jeep and the guy that was behind one of these big steel belts and he's pounding at him. And I saw the zero sort of throw a flicker of smoke from the tail. I had on his head. Suddenly, the guy is buckled over in his hair, steel belt that's been with a gun. I said, what the devil happened? So I jumped behind the machine gun. And I started pounding lead at him. He come in on a landing. The guys all ran over him because the plane was catching fire. They pulled him out. Well, we pulled him out. They rolled him all over the ground. And they put his pants out. And they, first thing you know, that's when I, got, I saw Colonel O'Brien. Yeah, I don't see that. He's talking to him with an interpreter. And he's got his 45 on his hand, holding it on him. Now, I don't, I couldn't understand what the two of them were saying, I mean, the interpreter and the Jap, but he wanted to know all of a sudden who this guy is. So the interpreter said, this is O'Brien, Colonel O'Brien, the regimental commander. The son of a bitch, he turns around, he spits at Colonel O'Brien's face. Hmm. I never saw him. he's so mad. O'Brien, he gets his 45, puts it flat in his hand, wham! He hits him right across the face. Now the Japs have no face. He put a face on him. He was <laughs> spitting teeth. He had blood coming out of his mouth. He says, get him out of here. He says, I'll kill him because I want to know where these planes are coming out of. We didn't know they were coming out of Rota. Yeah. There's an island there, yeah. or Tinian. There was another small island. But he says, I want to find out where these planes are coming out of. And that was the end of that. I never saw any more of that. They took him away and they said, that hell of Then I didn't see O'Brien again for quite a while. Did, uh, did you remember uh, Frank Albanese? Was he there at the time? Did that little incident? The name sounds familiar, right? I don't know. Albanese. Oh, A-L. Yeah. yeah. He was, uh, he was an S-4, I think, of the uh, 1st Battalion. It sounds familiar, but I can't place him. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Well, anyway, we moved out of Asledo and we moved up in the area. <coughs> and uh, 
we came across other areas there which there was some fighting and and some jab snipers and all that. And I saw a bullet go into a guy, one of the boys heel and give a little flicker of smoke. And you'd say, what? Well, how did it happen? We came into an area that was open and there was, and the ground was, there was like, like it was a farm, you know what I mean? It had been trampled down, but there were hills like small, like it was all plowed up ground, you know? And we're all laying in these little things here. And we were held up there. And up in front, about 50 yards up front, bombs were dropping. And they used to shoot up into the air, and they were coming down like like Christmas trees, it was. Burning, not, not red hot, but white hot stuff. And they, and they, they were yelling, don't let them things hit you, they'll go right through you. It was coming down, and it was on the road, it was about five or six hours. So I'm in a hole there, and there's a kid in front of me here. I hear tuck. I, mean, I happen to be looking at his heel, and all of a sudden he pulls his heel back. I saw that thing hit him in the heel, a bullet, and a little flicker of smoke come out. So I turned around to him. I said, go to the rear. I said, go ahead, go get that foot of yours fixed. And he disappeared. All of a sudden, right behind me, ping! And I looked behind me. I said, son of a bitch. This guy hit hit him in his foot and I was just over here and he's right there and then behind me. I got one thing in my mind, this son of a bitch, a sniper, he's bracketing in on me. Mm. So what did I do? I pull up, I pull my way back, I crawl back behind a, a palm tree. Don't you know that the next bullet hit right where I was? Because I saw the, the dust just yeah, jumping in the air. I said, son of a bitch, that bullet was going to be mine. I didn't see the sniper though. I don't know where the hell it came from, where he was. But mm. They had these long Arasaki rifles, you know, tall, longer than ours. Telescopes they, on? They had telescopes, but the long barrel, they made it, they made them smokeless. That's mm. why we used to call it smokeless rifles. There's ours at night, you can see the flame. But an air rifle, the Arasaki, you can see no flame. They were long barrels. And the, the sniper had a longer barrel. Mm -hmm. They were accurate. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of that one there. Then we've come out of there, the Christmas tree decorations all come down and bombing it, they were thrown there. So we moved up. We're coming now to the pod. There was other incidents there, but came to the sea. One, one area there where it was nice and flat. Lieutenant Fig, thanks to me. Fig Newton, he turned around, he said, Jufe, he said, where's the squad? I said, they're all behind me here. What was left of we moved up. We get all of a sudden firing from the front, so we all hit the ground. So this is, I saw Lind, Lund all of a sudden stand up, and he hollers back to him. He was here, I was here, another kid by the name of Sandoval was here. He, he stands up and he says, hey, Jufe, he's on the head. I said, okay, I'll be right over. This guy Sandy here hollers always, hey Joe, I'm hit. So I said, two of them are hit. So I crawl over to him, and he's bleeding from the side over here. So I'd rip this bandage out and put it's it on. Is Sandoval or Lopes? Sandoval. Sandoval. So I put it on him, and I tightened it up, and I gave him a couple of, so what do you call these, pills? Sulfur. Sulfur nilamide tablets. Sulfur nilamide tablets. And I'm yelling for medics, medics. Medic came over. In the meantime, I skipped this guy out, so I go to Lund. Lund was hit. So the way he was talking to me, you know what I mean? I said, that's not too bad. He said, that, he said, oh, my stomach is hurting me. So I said, okay. The medic comes over, picks him up, takes him away. Then he came back, because he was with us, with our platoon or squad. So I yelled over him, I said, how did Lund make out? He said, he didn't make it. What do you mean he didn't make it? He said, he got hit in the bottom by the, by the, over the stomach. The bullet came out of the back of his head. And I said, oh, he can. I said, Sandy, he's all right. He's, he's back there. They took care of him. Fick calls me. He says, come on over here. And he's behind a doom of sand. And we went over there. And that's when he told me, he says, there's Japs in that area. There's an awful lot of them. So he tells me, he said, Shall we fix bayonets and get them? I said, no. I said, that's suicide. 
So he said, what do you suggest? Now he's asking me, what do yeah. I suggest? I said, let's lob grenades in that area. And everybody there were in a line. Said, lob your grenades over as far as you can. Get two, three of them. Get rid of two or three of them. Suddenly there's a, there's a run for the ocean. About 30 or 40 Japs all running for the ocean. Mm -hmm. And they were all jumping in the ocean. And, and we opened up with our rifles. It was raining mm -hmm. down in the ocean. Boy, the bullets were... Every head that was bobbing was not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So from there, then we went, we moved out. So you were in the Tanap is that the Tanapag plane you probably were on? Where Tanapag, T A N A P A G. I, don't, I know you're talking about Tanapag. That comes from it, but as far as any areas in there, I couldn't tell you no names of them anymore. But it was it was on the ocean s side. I mean, you were near on the, the ocean side. But oh, wait a minute! Now, now I'm thinking of Garapan. Garapan was on the other side. Of the island it used to be, a, we were here. And the, it was the Marines who went into Garapan. It was supposed to be the capital of Saipan. Yeah. But anyway, we we went into this area here, nice and quiet, and the, things were nice. And there was a couple of other incidents there. I don't remember. Let me see now. Before the Bunzai attack. Well, I mean, anyway. We were getting ready now to move up ahead, and we did, and we moved up. We, this is where I saw General Ross one time. I was up on the top of a hill, and I yelled down to him, Ogden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had told you that I had scouted around, and I saw about 20 or 30 tanks, it seemed to me, and a big hole. And so help me, God, where they disappeared to when they went looking for him again, they weren't there. There was not even a truck there. But they made me go in there nice and easy, but to come out by G, they opened up machine guns on me. And I was dodging them. That's another one there where I was running. I was taking three steps one way and taking four steps another. I was flying, I was crawling, I was doing everything. But I got out of there. And that's when General Ross told me when I, when I called him by his name. I said, where are you heading for? He says, and there was a red sky, he said, our tanks are out there. They found those tanks that you saw yesterday. Because he used to be, I used to know him very well. One time we passed him in Schofield Barracks without saluting him. Mm. He grabbed us. You know what he told us? Don't forget to salute the second lieutenant. Don't worry about me. <laughs> Which is another story that happened to me in Washington, D.C. with a second lieutenant. Yeah. But anyway, we moved up. And uh, there was a couple of other incidents there anyway, but I don't remember right now. But it'll probably come to me. Do you remember sort of when that was? Was this in July? It's in, it's in, was it in early July? Well, this must have been all in July because July 7th right. was the big bonsai attack. And this must have been the early part of July when we moved into that area. Now, uh, there, was, there was one area there I remember. We went into it. was a beautiful area too, and there was firing going on. This here, I can say now. This is the the night the night be the night before the the bonsai attack. I'm going to go into that now. What happened there was I was moving up into this area here. It was a flat ground, and the troops were all scattered, right and left. But we were moving up up ahead. Lieutenant Drovis, no, Lieutenant, Captain McGlynn. Yeah, he was a company commander of a B company. Right. He come by me, dashing by me, and I said, I said, McGlynn, where are you heading for? He said, I'm going to the rear. I said, why? He said, Japs are behind us there. They're hitting our troops back in the, in the back there. Some of our boys back there, and I want to see what's going on. Okay, fine. So we were moving up. Then I saw Lieutenant Drovers. So I yelled to him, I said, Drovers, I said, where are you heading to? He said, I'm going to the rear. I said, what's going on? He says, Captain McGlynn just got killed. I said, I just saw him a minute ago. He says, he ran to the back and he said, so he told me right there and then, he said, you know, I got married before I came out here in Saipan and McGlynn was my best man. All of a sudden I get another report 
Lieutenant Drovers got killed back there. I said, oh, Christ. When you say back there, I mean, they were behind you. As they you were, were behind us a few, few maybe a couple of two, about a hundred yards or so back. Well, the Japanese had infiltrated them behind. They had, be, they had infiltrated. And this is also from what the, what the uh, third battalion had missed. You see, they cut off a peninsula there, and somehow the Japs in that peninsula where they were surrounded broke through and they were behind us. You know, that island, it was, well, it didn't take too long to, to catch up with us. Yeah. So, all right. I said, oh, my God. Then there was a kid there, too. His name was Greek Satyrs. We used to call him Greek Satyrs. He had a throwing arm, which was out of this world. Sometimes, by Jesus, when, when I couldn't reach a certain area with a grenade, I used to call, hey, Greek, get this grenade, pull the pin, and get it the hell out there. I can't throw that far. He had a wing that was out of this world. He was a baseball player. Yeah. There was a guy named, uh, was the name of William Barrelis, B-A-R-A-L-I-S? No. B-A-R-A-L-I-S? No, this guy's name was Greek Satis. Satis. We used, to, we used to know, the name we only knew for him was, he was a private Greek Satis. Yeah. He'd come over to me and he's got his hand busted up. So I said, my grand, I said, Greek, what are you doing over here? And it was his right arm, too. I said, oh my God, I said, this guy ain't going to throw a baseball for nobody. Yeah. I told him, get the hell out of here, Greek. I said, go get it fixed. <coughs> he disappeared. Next time I met him, I was on a hospital ship. We go into that some of the... Right now, I told because I met him in a hospital ship where I was, and I saw this Greek say, he says, you know, son, I said, what happened here? You were hitting the arm or the hand, but he had his stomach all swollen up. He said, yeah, when I went back there, I got hit in the stomach. Mm. Well, he died on the ship, on a hospitalization ship. Yeah. Mm. He wasn't supposed to touch any food, so they gave him a tray of food without knowing about his condition. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. And he blew up to pieces. But anyway, we'll go back now. So we're moving into this area again. It's a beautiful area, I swear. I don't, I don't believe it was combat going on. Do you, just can you, was that, uh, was that on the, I'm trying to get the Gibraltar jargon, was that on the east coast, not the west coast of the island? We were, well, looking at Saipan, we were moving along on the right side of it. I don't know if it was... Up north of Machian Bay? And yeah, growing up from, yeah. Growing, because Magician Bay was right, right side, but back of us. Back of it, yeah. Right. But we were moving up on that area because we were in the center. Marines were here, Marines on this side, and we were through the center, but the Marines were thinning out, and they had moved into an area there which... Is that like their Cha-Cha village? Is that <coughs> All those villages there, there were some of the craziest villages. You know, I came across areas there where my scouts come in. There was one area I'll never forget. They, they told me, hey, Joe, what's the matter? Shindu. There was a big Shindu church there, you know what I mean? Big high tower, and there was a big cave underneath it. There was gold boulders in it. Hmm. Gold boulders. So my scout said, you want to take a couple of down and touch them? I said, they're yeah, probably all booby trap. Hmm. Sure enough, I went up to the sea little cave right alongside that Shindu, and I'm looking at them, and there's a bunch of real boulders about this big, lined up. So I had a I had a little piece of a hook, like, you know, with a piece of string, and I threw it over there, and I put myself in a distance, I told these guys, and I stuck. So I pulled the string, and all of a sudden, that place was, mmm, that whole cave just closed up. I, I told yeah. you they're moving. So I, call, I used to call the engineers all the time when we come across these shindus, I tell them, blow it up, because the tops were used for observation. So they knocked it out. Now, we came across here, which is practically the last phase. Well, after all this incident, that's when, uh, huh? I should have brought a map, that's fine. That's when the Colonel O'Brien came over to me that night. And he threw a blanket on the ground. He said, Joof, he said, put these bars on. I, was, I looked at him, I said, put the bars on. I said, oh. So I'm looking at him. Sergeant Mario Alcanero is right alongside of me. He tells me, he said, 
hey Joe, if you put those bars on, they're going to transfer you. I said, oh, I said, oh no. I said, so I told the colonel, I said, no, I said, I don't want to leave A Company. I don't want the bars. Sergeant Huffy takes it. As I told you, he was our staff man. Sergeant Huffy? Yeah, yeah Sergeant Huffy. He took the bars. He gets a good case. We came to a reserve area that, that day, and we stayed there for a whole day, and some of the boys went down to the ocean, took their shoes and what was left of their stockings, mm -hmm. and they were washing their feet. Now, Huffy was one of them. There were bodies floating around there, I remember. So I told Huffy, for one of them, I remember saying, Huffy, don't wash your feet in there. That water may be contaminated. He didn't give a damn. So I understand that he went back to Troy because his feet were with the, some sort of a dermatitis he had. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he went back to Troy and they gave him a big parade, the lieutenant. He didn't even have a squad. He couldn't even handle a squad. Yeah. All right. So I didn't give a damn. I said, but a couple of guys come over to me. I, that night I spent the night in a foxhole. I swear. Must have been on a beach. It must have been six feet deep, but I don't know. I wake up from the dead of heat, the dead of sleep, and feel something walking on my chest. I could have swore, I said, in the darkness, there must be a chap feeling me around. It was land crabs walking on me. Oh, dear. From the so I just grabbed him and threw him the hell out. So that morning, the guys come over to me and say, Hey, Jupe, I said, what's the matter? He said, a big truck just came in. I said, so what about it? He said, instead of bringing stockings and cigarettes and chocolate, you know what they brought us? Sweaters, right off the equator, sweaters and shaving kits. I said, what? He said, shaving kits and sweaters. Boy, he said, out there, all you got to do is just sneeze and you'd sweat like a bullet. Yeah. So I, when I said, so I got my Tommy gun. I had a Tommy gun beside my rifle. And I pull it back. I walk over to the truck driver. I said, Get this goddamn truck out of here with those sweaters and junk in there and bring back cigarettes, chocolate, and stockings. That's all we want. I said, God damn it, I said, I'll give you five minutes to come back. Otherwise, I'm coming back and I'm going to boil the hell off this island. And boy, I was mad enough to do it, too. I swear, I swear, you guys, the American Red Cross did that. Hmm. All right, they came back. And I think I gave them five minutes to <laughs> sure. They flew back, I think, truck and all. And they had cigarettes, stockings, chocolate, other bars of candy and gum. But I only took cigarettes. Me, it was cigarettes. I got tired of smoking Japanese cigarettes because you need a book of matches to keep one Japanese yeah. cigarette going. But anyway, to make a long story short, that was over with. And we moved out. We went into a this area here was a beautiful area. And I'm sort of on a, like on a hill going on the side. So I put my foxhole way up there. And the guys all form a line all along. And at night, the darkness came along. Japanese were firing, Japanese were firing machine guns at us with tracers on them. Yeah. They never used tracers right across our foxhole line. I said, son of a bitch, they know where the hell we are. I said, this ain't so good. All right, I, didn't, I couldn't do nothing about it. It was dark. You move around in the dark, you're dead. So I got another foxhole next to me with another guy, and I hear somebody calling me, Jufrey! I said, oh, Christ, I don't believe it. Jufrey, I'm hit. I'm hurting. This kid alongside me tells me, hey, Joe, he's calling too. That sounds like Orzas. You probably heard Who? of his name, Orzas. There was a private in my squad by the name of Orzas. He was built like an ox, built, built with muscle. He was muscle bound for ground. Yeah. He was a strong kid. So I said, oh, shit, I said. So I told the guy next to me, I said, shut up. He said, that sounds like Orzas. He's calling you. I said, shut up. I said, that's a Japanese trick. Yeah. They want me out of here. You guys will kill me or they'll kill me. I said, shut up. Don't say them where I am. Nothing. He wasn't hit. Because I met him in peacetime up in Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn 
as they always is. What are you doing out here? He was from Missouri. He said, I want to go see Harlem. Somebody want to see Harlem. But he told me, he said, I never called him a combat. No. So anyway, we're sitting up there. I'm sitting in the foxhole there at night. And so, help me God, there was a lot of activity going on. At dawn, I wake up. That I must have been drowsing. From the noise down the side, the bottom of the hill. The noise, the yelling. It sounded like Babe Ruth was in Yankees there with the Yankees. They had all run in the stadium. Was yeah. Yelling. I said, oh my God. What the hell's going on? This is on the morning of the 7th? Yeah. So, it was just about twilight, like you can know. You just about see in the darkness. And I looked down the hill there, and I see two of my sergeants, machine gun sergeants, with the light machine guns. One was Sergeant Thurman. Edward Thurman. The other one was, I think, it was Berger. I'm not sure. They're down there with the two light machine guns down below me, and there's two anti-tank guns there. Mm -hmm. So I gave firing orders. I turned around to the to the anti-tank gun men. I said, "Use canister shell shells, canister, canister anti-personnel shells." I just quiet them son of a bitches down there. I don't know what that was going on, but there was. The yelling would look like there were hundreds. So my two sergeants, they opened up with machine guns, and these anti-tank guns opened up with the canisters, and they quiet down. Okay. So I leaned back on my foxhole, and I was resting. Then all of a sudden, it started again, and it was daylight. So I looked over the side of my foxhole, you know, looking down there, and I'm firing like crazy. Bye, 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 bye. bye putting clips in and firing away down there. Figured I can't see much, but you know, anything down there, I just, I don't give a damn. I looked down the hill, the two machine gunners were out. Mm. The anti tank guns were out. There's, there was two or three men to each anti tank gun. They were laying over the tripod, dead. And the two sergeants, I looked at them, I said, oh my God, they're dead. So somehow or another, with one way or another way that maybe God up there was watching me, my rifle then all of a sudden jams up on me from the heat. I'm pulling, I'm kicking the bolt with my foot now, an M1. Yeah. I'm kicking it with my foot, the shell, to take the shell out and, and put another one in by, by hand. Yeah. I'm firing. This was another way somebody up there was telling me, get out of here. I look over the foxhole, I see two goddamn Japs crawling up on me. I think I saw them with short, whether they had knives or what they were, they right between their teeth and they're crawling up on me. So I pulled the breech out of my rifle and I threw it at one. I took the other with the rifle and went, I threw the other and they ran for it. But that was for me to say also get out. Yeah. So I got up and I went down the side of the hill. I got right in the midst of the firing. That's where I caught one in the leg. I said, oh, son of a bitch. I felt my leg. I said, it's in. It's in here, all right. I come across one of the boys from my <clears throat> from my country there, from the 3rd platoon, I think it was, laughing his brains out. Is that working all right? That's right. Yeah, I'm just checking on. He's laughing his brains out. And he says, Joe, what are you doing here? I says, why? So we said, so I asked him, I says, what am I doing here? I said, what do, what, do, what do you think I'm doing here? So I told him, what are you laughing at? He said, I don't see you. What you do with your rifle? I said, burned out. An M1 burned out. He's got, so he's, he's on one foot and on the knee, and he's got two Tommy guns. He says, here, take this gun. And he throws one at me. So I'm still looking at him. Who's this again? I don't know his name. Okay. I forget his name. Now, before the Banzai attack came off, which I just spoke about in this last reel, which had just ended, I had come into a, an area where it was jungly like and high grass, and the Lieutenant Fig Noon, he always used to depend on me for everything. He told me, he says, go into that wood, into that grassy area, which was that high, about six feet the grass was. He said, see what's going on in there. I, 
yes sir and then walked away I came across there private Moschimo an Indian in our company we had two Indians Moschimo was being used with, oh, with Chinese words you know what I mean to confuse the jobs but yeah I hear they were doing <coughs> other things but I never searched into any further but all I know is that I moved into that area and I found my boy from my squad, Pretty, with the BAR standing over a big high ditch, which was about 15 feet deep, all dug out, big, big as a room, maybe about 15, 20 feet wide. And there was there all kinds of bunks with Japs laying on it. They might have been wounded, or they might have been what, I don't know. But as I looked down, a hole in the ground with a burlap bag on it opened up, and I saw three Japs jumping out. One, two, three, and next to the hole, laying flat, quiet. So I told this guy, Pretty, I said, Pretty, get him. There's three Japs that just come out of that hole there. They're laying flat. They were on their stomachs. I says, turn that BAR on him, and then turn the BAR on every goddamn bed over here. I don't know what they were. Yeah. Pretty says, no, I can't do it. So I took the BAR away from him. I put a magazine in there with 20 bullets in there, you know, the BAR is all that. And I fired at these three guys that came out of that hole in the ground. They fell. They moved because the bullets were going right into them. And then the rest of them I was spraying around that area. Yeah. I gave the gun back to Pretty. I told him, now finish the job. I said, I got to get out of here. He put another magazine in there, and he's firing away on automatic fire. Now, BAR, you can't, you got to hold it down. You can't hold them down. Yeah. They're faster than machine guns. And he's got and he's spraying away down there in nice bursts. Then finally I turned around and I said, Pretty, that's enough. So we stopped. From there in, I don't know what happened to him. I didn't see him anymore. I moved back to report to Fig Newton what the hell I saw here. I come back and I told Fig Newton, I said, what happened? I told him, I, I said, whatever it is, if it's a hospital where they're all, <clears throat> they're all dead. So he told me, he said, did you hear about Moschino? I said, what about him? I said, I just saw him when I came over there. He said, he came out of there after, while you were walking in there, he came out and got killed. I said, holy God. I said, what the devil is going on? Hmm. Guys are getting killed left and right. Mm -hmm. so you said he was an Indian, the American Indian? American Indian. There was two of them in our, in our squad. In our, uh, either my platoon, but they weren't my company, the way company. The other one, I never found out what it was. They were Cherokees. Oh, yeah. But Moschimo, he was a chubby guy. Spoke child spoke Indian very fluently. I heard he was dead. I said, oh, God almighty. But anyway, so now that incident's gone. So we go into the incident of the Banzai attack. Okay, let's take a little five minute break All here. Right. Oops. So we're into the Banzai attack. So what happened was after I came down from that hill where I had the incident by giving the firing order to two anti-tank guns and my two machine gun sergeants and I found them all dead and I threw my rifle which was misfiring I threw it at the Japs who were coming up to kill me I came off the hill and I came into and right into the middle of what the, during the Banzai attack I picked up from one of the boys there who was laughing at me and he says, what happened to my rifle? I told him, I told him it burned out. So he gave me one of the two Tommy guns he was leaning on. And he continued laughing. And I asked him, where's the ammunition? He says, that's what I'm laughing at, no ammo. God closes one window and opens another one. There's a kid laid on the ground dead, and he's got two magazines of 45 Tommy gun bullets on his belt. So I took him off his belt. I was having a picnic of a time with that Tommy gun, 
spraying short bursts at Japs front, back, side, all around me. But in the meantime, I turned around and I caught one bullet then on the leg. And I don't even know where it came from. All I know is that I felt my leg and I said, ah, it's in there. So I continued firing the gun. And I walked over to the area on the side and I saw there was Lieutenant, no, Major, what was Colonel O'Brien's assistant in the regiment? It was Major... Emmett Catlin? No. McDonald, I think, or something like that. Well, I saw his assistant, Colonel O'Brien's assistant, he was a regimental assistant, waving a 45 in midair, and he's hollering, this is it, this is it, we got him now, they're going to, we got him where we want him. And then, right there and then, I caught another, another burst right in the chest on the side. And, and I still was on my feet, and I still had the Tommy gun I was firing away on the side. I, I turned around a few minutes later after burning, after a few more shells, and I got hit again in the back. I caught another bullet right about the lower part of my back. And, and there I had now three holes in me, and I was hurting. Then as I moved away from that area, and I was firing away yet at the Tommy gun that I still had some bullets at short bursts, my Tommy gun was still working good. I caught another bullet, which penetrated my helmet, and went through, and the bullet dropped out, but it put, it hit my head, and it ripped it open. It didn't crack my skull, but I, I was afraid that I was blind. I couldn't see very clear, but then my sight came back very slowly, like I was looking through a field glass. So there, whatever happened to me, I don't know. I might have passed out, or whatever, I don't remember. I just remember another kid coming over to me, my name was Gonzalez, he was a gook that I had trained on Company A while we were in Hawaii. He was a Hawaiian gook. I was, he come over to me, he says, Jufri, Jufri, just put your arm around my shoulder. He said, I'll get you out of here. Well, I put my arm around his shoulder, and he told me who he was, but I told him, I said, I don't know who you are. I couldn't remember his name or even what he looked like. I, next thing I remember, he put me down, and uh, I told him, where are you going? He said, I'm shooting to the rear. So I told him, I said, why don't you come in here with me? Now, there was a perimeter, and there was a bunch of us guys in there who were wounded. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I found a rifle with two bullets. Now, you have the story about that rifle and two bullets. Tommy Baker come along. Yeah. He's limping, and I'm leaning on my, on the inner perimeter on the other side with my rifle pointed out at the Japs, and I asked Tommy, I said, Tommy, what are you doing here? Tommy was a type of a soldier, like I said a million times, you never can tell what he was going to do next. Yeah. So he asked me if I had any ammunition. I said, no, I only have two bullets left. I said, I need one but a son of a bitch that comes for me, and the next one is mine. I said, well, let them take me prisoner. So Tommy started to walk away, and he's limping. So I called to him. I said, Tommy, I said, come on in here. I said, you get the heel shot off. He had the whole heel of his foot missing. So he told me, he says, now, he said, I'm going up front. I'm going up to join Obi, which was mm -hmm. the regimental commander O'Brien. And that was the last that I saw of him. I laid in that perimeter until the high tide came along. The shore was spiked with mines. So when the high tide came along, which was about a couple of, three, four hours later, a big tank came in from the ocean, floating tanks. The same tank that we had come in, in fact, I told him. 
when we landed on this on this island. Like a, they call alligator. I don't know what they call them, yeah. but they were they looked to me like tanks with threads on them, mm -hmm. tracks on them. They floated, so that came in, and with their machine guns firing over our head, and they were grabbing us wounded guys like sacks of potatoes, dumping us into the tank. Yeah. Then finally they went out to the ocean again, and they took us over to the back of the the area there where it was supposed to be safe. When I got off of there, there was Sergeant Ream's brother. Now, Sergeant Ream was a third platoon squad leader in Company A. And his brother was driving his Jeep. And he asked me, he said, did you see my brother? I said, no, I didn't see your brother. So he said, come on, get in the Jeep, I'll take you to the hospital. <coughs> he offered me a drink of water. And I said, no, I can't drink it. I said, I don't know where my wound is, if it's in the stomach or what. So he took me to the hospital, and I got off in the black dark and walked into the hospital tent with a big pyramidal tent. And I sat on one of the bunks there, or one of the shift made beds, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly two men came in, and they said, We'll take care of you guys tomorrow morning since he's walked into the sea tent. So I grabbed one of them by the arm. I said, no, you're not going nowhere, as I said. You're going to examine me now, I said, because. So he asked me, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm hitting the head, I'm hitting the chest, I'm hitting the back, and I'm hitting the leg. So I turned around. I turned around. I said, you know, I said, I'm not panicky yet, but you guys are making me panicky. They started to ask me questions and they were tapping my chest and they were tapping my other chest yeah. and they said where's it hurt I said I didn't know my right from my left so the wind up was they brought me into a big big tremendous tent mash it was seemed to me like there was hundreds of doctors in there all operating the beds in there were all big operating tables every one of those doctors was full of blood and guys on there, Marines, Army, Navy, all being operated. I remember the last words was, he said, now we're going to give you an injection in the arm, cut your clothes away, start counting backwards from 100. I don't remember ever saying 100. I was out. The next thing, I, should I tell him about the incident with, I thought I saw angels or voices talking to me? Do you want it's to? It's interesting. That's where I get the quotation now. So while I was out, I see in my sleep like there was little white things floating around my head. I don't know what they were, but something was telling me, you can't come in here because you have broken the Ten Commandments over and over. <laughs> so I've always thought that maybe they were angels, <laughs> and maybe I was dead and I was going to heaven. <laughs> then another voice was telling me, you can't come down here because you've been through hell already. So here I am, I said, I had came back to earth. Now whether I was dead maybe at the time and they brought me back, I don't know. But all I can say is that when I came to, three days later, I was in bed in a big pyramidal tent outside, in daylight, sitting up. Some major came over to me and says, are you hungry? I says, yes. I says, I'm very hungry. So. He, he turned around and he told me, how do you feel? I said, well, I said, I'm draining. I feel something dripping out of my back. I had little hoses on me. So he said, what would you like to eat? I said, I'll have two eggs once over, a cup of coffee, some orange juice, and toast. Well, lo and behold, believe it or not, this tray of food that I ordered came right in front of me, and it was put on the bed with me. And I remember I just ate a little bit of toast with bread and everything came out again. So the doctor told me, he says, don't let it worry you. He said, that's a good sign. At least you can eat. Don't worry about it. In the meantime, I asked the doctor, how long have I been here? He said, you've been out three days. I laughed at him. I said, out three days. He said, you were in that tent. Look at it. And it was all full of holes. He said, visiting Charlie used to come around and scrape the place. So I laughed at him. I said, they were trying to get me while I was sleeping also, or out. He said, that nurse over there, 
every time they come around, she used to come over and, and jump on you. I said, oh boy, I said, yeah. so I told her, I said, oh my God, I said, See, you can thank her. So from there, I was evacuated <clears throat> and they took me in a Jeep with no clothes on, with a sheet wrapped around me that I'd look like Bahama Gandhi. Oh, moment, yeah. And I'm being going down, I said, where the devil are we going? And I meet Fig Newton, full of people. I meet him and he tells me, he said, oh, he says, Sergeant Jufre, he says, I'm glad to see you made it. So I looked at him, I says, I see they got you in the arm. He said, yeah, I got a bullet through the arm. And he told me, he said, they're going to take you now into that tent, they're going to take x-rays. Then they're going to put you on that big ship out there. And there was the USS Samaritan. Beautiful white ship with a big red cross on the outside. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I never saw a fig anymore, but I was in a cage like net, which was lifted by two hooks. Over in the middle, I could see the whole island of Saipan. And I was saying my prayers, what the hell am I doing way up here? A sniper by G05, but it was safe. And they put me on board the ship. And there, I was put in bed at below deck. And one day later, I must have been out again, I don't know, because there's stories that I must have passed out a few times, which there were other stories telling me that there were guys that carried me here and there, or they found me in a, in a minefield, I, I don't know. But anyway, I used to get the most atrocious headaches, and I used to see tanks in my, <coughs> in my dreams, in my sleep, Japanese tanks were grown out of the ground, and Japanese were grown out of the ground. So I called one of the doctors there, and I said, don't give me any more shots for pain. He said, I told him, God damn it, otherwise I'll roll a grenade under your chair. I said, I'm seeing all kinds of Japs. And I said, get, see big bubbles, like. Mm. And I used to force myself to wake up when I could. So the doctor told me, he said, he said tomorrow we're gonna take those stitches out of your head, because they've giving you a lot of pressure and all that. I was good. And the next day, I remember, they took about, a, I don't know, about 150 stitches out of my head. And uh, from there in, I was in trouble all the time. Mm. I used to sneak up and go up on deck. Sunny, beautiful air. And the nurse would be up there after me, and she'd say, Sergeant Jufre, downstairs, you gotta stay in bed. And I used to argue with her, I tell her, but up here it's nice, you know, yeah. it's sunny. No, you're going to stop bleeding. And I said, no, I won't bleed anymore. I, I tell her, I don't bleed that easy. This happened until finally they gave up. They used to leave me alone on deck. And then that's where I found out that Sergeant Reams died under the operating table. And uh, private Greek sailors, yeah. he died with a tray of food given to him, which he, yeah. he wasn't supposed to get. And I saw Sergeant McLaughlin. Did we hear that name before? Uh, Sergeant McLaughlin from, uh, I think it was in the third, second platoon, anyway. I think he died because Bazon told me, he says, I, I can't find him anymore. But, you know, Bazon sent me a few letters and told me where I find certain guys. Right after the war, you know, I I went over to see Sergeant McLaughlin at his home. He caught a grenade, practically blew up right in front of him. He had a hand missing. He was a pretty boy. Okay. Uh, he had his face all scarred up. He's from Troy, right? Troy. And yeah. he had the other hand claw-like. Yeah. And his legs were mangled up, too, from the same shell or grenade that exploded it's, on him. It's, it's, uh, it's McLaughlin, right? M small C. McLaughlin, yeah. I, I have tried to reach him. I got a phone number for him in Troy, as a matter well, of fact. Well, I sent him a letter recently, and I got no reply. Yeah. Uh, but I went up there to see him, and uh, he was in a very sad shape. He was just married to a pretty girl, but you couldn't talk to him. Yeah. I think his nerves were all... But anyway, the way he was, I felt very sorry for him. And I left soon after I saw him because you couldn't talk to him right.
but I understand that after all these years have gone by, a good 50 years, he's got about seven children all grown up. Yeah. And this last letter I sent up there came back, not at this address, so yeah. he might have passed away, who knows. I had a uh, phone number for him, and that was disconnected. That's, that's and I also saw up there in Schenectady, I saw Sergeant O'Konzak. He was a bartender, and he was in a terrible mood also. And I spoke to him a little while. I don't remember the conversation with him, but I left then also, because I was heading for to see Niagara Falls. Oh, yeah. I saw Captain or Lieutenant Butkus at Linderman General Hospital, just when we had landed off the uh, Samaritan Hospital ship. And I asked him, how you doing? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. On Saipan, I saw the captain, or lieutenant yet at the time, was laying behind a bunch of rocks, and I went over to him with, a, with my injuries. I crawled over to him, and I told him, I said, Buck, what the hell are you doing here yet? You're all shot up. And he told me, he says, I was just operated on hernias in Hawaii, and he came out, and he said he caught a bullet behind him, and it blew his scars all wide open again. Mm. And he told me, he says, I don't know if I'm farting from my my <laughs> rectum or my my belly. Yeah. And believe me, when I met him at Litterman General, and he was all stitched up, he told me the same thing. He said, I don't know where I'm farting from, <laughs> but the smell was out of this world, I too. Mm. And that was the end. I never saw him anymore. Then from Letterman General, we came to Newton D. Baker General Hospital. Newton D. General Hospital, they accomplished practically nothing. So I was sent to Fort Dix. Fort Dix, we laid around there for about 20 some odd days. We were supposed to take three days, and finally we got thrown out. Yeah, <coughs> That's right. And here I am with a few stories that I sent to the Orion Gallivander and talking to Mr. Francis O'Brien, mm. nephew of Colonel O'Brien, William O'Brien, regimental commander of the 105th Regiment, who was my former Company A captain. I just had a, a question. Uh, you mentioned there was somebody uh, waving a 45 in midair. Uh, I can't saying remember we, his name. Would that be uh, uh, McCarthy, Edward McCarthy? That's it, yeah. Major McCarthy. Major Edward McCarthy. Right. Major McCarthy, that's who it was. He was waving a 45. He said, come on, this is it, this is it, this is it. This is it, yeah. Said, this is it. I said, I don't know what happened to him, though. Did he come out of it or not? I don't know. Uh, I think he came out of it. Uh, I don't know if he's still alive. I don't know. Either. I can. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. Nine out of ten guys that I that I knew who came out of it today, I, I have all outlived them all because I am at the bright age of eighty, working towards eighty-one. Yeah. I got a pacemaker. I got two bullets in me yet. One in my lung and one in my spine. And I got my two knees overhauled. I got stainless steel in my knees. I preferred gold bullion, yeah. but they gave me stainless steel. Let, let me let me just read one more thing. I just want to get this clarified. In Love's book at page 458, you, you, yeah. you've, you've heard this before, but it says, um, it says, uh, Sergeant Adolf Auzis. Yeah, that's Auzis. Auzis started out but it only gone a short distance when he saw Sergeant Felix M. Jufra right. lying on the ground. At Azus, Azus, say that Jufra was unconscious from a head wound, and as no one seemed to have time to do anything about him, he picked him up. Right. As he lifted uh, Jufra onto his arms, he received another bolt wound in his arm. Mm -hmm. uh, so on. Is that? I mean, do you think that that does that happened? I don't know. You don't know. <coughs> Well, this may be, is he... I took an appeal from the VA, and they were asking me, were you ever conscious or unconscious? I said, I don't know. 
Mm. And they asked me over and over and over again because I was trying to hit them in a rating for encephalopathy. Because there was some kind of encephalopathy. You know what that is. It's like a, uh, like epilepsy. It's only this is from uh -huh. a gunshot wound or a severe blow to the head. Uh -huh. And I told him, I said, I don't know. I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, this but I couldn't prove a thing. Yeah. But I said, man, might have been unconscious. I don't know. Now, if I had that information you sent me there, that uh, what you just read, I would have submitted to that rating board. Yeah. Going, hey, smoke this in your pipe. This could have come from this guy, Azusa. He could have said that to Lawrence. Horses. I, Horses. Yeah. I met this guy, Horses. He was a private. I don't know where to get the sergeant business from. But anyway, he was a private at the time. I met him in East, Eastern Parkway, Brooklyn, after the war. I met him there by, by coincidence I met him. And I asked him, what are you doing here? He's from way out of state. He says, I'm heading for Harlem. They want to see Harlem. So I had nothing else to do. I was still in uniform. I said, okay, let's go. Let's go see Harlem. I'll take you there. I said, but it's not exactly what you think it is, I said. But that's another story, what happened yeah. up in Harlem. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to know. We ran out of there soon after about, have we spent a half a day there. We grabbed the cab. I said, let's get out of here before they find us in the East River. Flow. Yeah. The driver of the cab told us that. Well, I think I mentioned to you, and I haven't been uh, able to prove it, but at, on, on Okinawa, this fellow, Auzis? Auzis? Oh, A-U-Z-I-S. Yeah, it's Auzis. Auzis. Uh, he got the Silver Star. I, I'll, I, can, I haven't confirmed that, but that's... I'll have to... Well, I don't know either, but maybe he made sergeant when he went into Okinawa. I don't know. Yeah. Well, but he wasn't a sergeant while I was there. Okay. Well, it's high panic. He still wasn't a private. I tell you, on Saipan, nobody, got, nobody made any promotions or anything like that. Yeah. Now, actually, there's something there you told me in that letter that Lund made uh, PFC or he made Sergeant. Yeah. No, Lund was a private. Right. Well, he said he was, I told him, I, like I said, he was in my squad. He was a good egg, good fella. Anything I told him to do, he always jumped out and did. But, like I said, some boys get killed. Why? I don't know. Uh, yeah, see, in, in the book, in the book, uh, Love's book, he is identified as C-373. Uh, I didn't really think it was. Uh, PFC Leo Lun, that's what, that's... PFC right. Sandoval and PFC Leo Lund, so but they were just PVT, right? Private. That's right. They were both in my squad. I know yeah. them. Yeah. They were. There was no promotion in my squad. But the only thing I can say about about what happened there was too that I read what he called that that Lund was part of headquarters. What the hell was he doing in headquarters? I'm saying. Do you have it there? No, I don't know. But then Lund was with me all the way through. How we got into headquarters? All right, there were times where I did lose track of my whole squad, but somehow I used to find them once in a while. Well, we'll sort him out. Well, listen, uh, uh, th I think we think. Shut this off. I just want yeah, to tell you sure. one thing. That